Hey, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. If you've followed me very long at all, you know I am a huge, huge, huge Elvis fan. The first records I ever listened to were my mom's 45s of Elvis, and my first albums I ever bought were of Elvis. The first concert I ever went to was of Elvis. And I say laughingly, but kind of serious and accurately, that the first celebrity interview I ever did was Elvis's manager, Colonel Parker. Last year, I had the privilege through a mutual friend by the name of Marshall Terrell, and he you see his name behind me here. Um, he, we had mutual friends by way of Ken Mansfield, the late Ken's, Ken Mansfield, who was uh, uh, formerly of uh, Capitol Records and Apple Records and was at the rooftop concert of the Beatles. Uh, Ken was friends, uh, uh, very close friends with Marshall. Marshall worked with Ken on some one or two of his books or more, and uh, I interviewed Ken a couple, several times, in fact. And then we also have other mutual friends by way of Chris O'Dell, who I've interviewed, and the lovely and beautiful and talented big sister of mine, I say, uh, Nancy Andrews. And so Marshall and I had been friends for you know two or three years now. And when I saw that he was working on this book that you see behind me, Elvis and the Colonel, I said, dude, I got to talk to you, man. Let's interview. And the original plan was to interview Greg McDonald, who actually worked for Colonel Tom Parker. Sadly, right as we were getting ready to set up the interview, Greg uh, was diagnosed with colon cancer, underwent uh, treatment for it, and then sadly passed away. Um, very recently, uh, two weeks, in fact, before the book was supposed to come out. And so, um, you know, I wanted to interview both Greg and Marshall. Marshall's carrying Greg's load of this now and, you know, speaking exclusively about the book. And that's what this interview is about. It's fascinating as all get out. It The book clears a lot of misconceptions and downright lies about Colonel Tom Parker and Marshall does a wonderful job in talking about that in this interview. So if you're an Elvis fan or just a music history buff or even a marketing buff, because Colonel Parker was a master marketer and he changed the landscape of celebrity marketing and concert marketing forever. The, his tactics and methods are still used today to great success. So the book is well worth your investment. And this interview is well worth your time to listen to and watch. It's a fun interview. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Marshall Terrell, co-author of the book, Elvis and the Colonel, that he co-wrote with Greg McDonald, who is a protege of Colonel Tom Parker. So without any further ado, here's that interview. Please share it. Please subscribe to this channel, whichever one you're watching or listening to it through. And please tell friends about it. And because I think they'll enjoy this as well. So take care. Good morning, my friend. How are you doing? Good. I'm getting a last minute bite. All right. Are you near Sevierville or? I live in Sevierville. Okay. So um, I had a friend. His name was Rex Mansfield. He was, he served in the army with Elvis and I did a book with him and oh. his wife st still lives there. So I visited Sevierville a couple of times. Oh, wow. Wow, was yeah, I live I live a mile and a half, two miles up the road from Dollywood. Okay. So, yeah, I've been here about 10 years. I live next door to my dad. And uh, I was thinking about, uh, you know, going back and uh, as I was preparing for this call and we connected, I guess, you know, we began communicating through our mutual late friend, Ken Mansfield. I mean, yeah. you knew him quite well. I just knew him through interviews and I would... Um, I would uh, check on him after he started undergoing treatment, and and, uh, and that gosh, it's hard to believe he's been gone over a year now, going on a year and a half, I think. Yeah, he's been fighting cancer for twenty five years. I mean, he's stuck in there a long time. Tough guy, wonderful yeah. guy. I, I tell you, I've got all of his books. I asked him. This was probably about six months before he passed. I shot him a note. I said, hey, my friend, do you mind if I send you my books, my copies of your books? But I would love to have your signature on my books. He said, no problem. And I sent him the, you know, a box with all the books in there and a return postage label. 
I'll try to say it without getting emotional about it, but some of the things he wrote in there were so cool. Yeah. You mentioned Chris O'Dell. We we have her as a mutual friend and also as uh, Nancy Andrews. You know, so oh, yeah. So we, 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 we enjoy some of the same friendships and some of the same circles. Yeah. You must uh, Na- and Nancy's, you know, is very, very special. Um, I, I, I connected with her. Uh, I just feel like she's a bigger sister and, uh, she's working on a book now and I, I really want it to, uh, succeed, you know, for her sake. Yeah. She yeah. Really, she, I, I felt like, I don't know if she's how much she's told you about Ringo, but she really got a raw deal from him. Yeah. We've, we've had a conversation or two <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, you're not well, going to have to be this, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're we're getting together. I'd love to talk to you about all your books, but we want to focus on the Elvis one sure. now. I, mean, I I you know I'm saddened that when we first started talking about doing an interview, it was originally going to be with uh, with Greg McDonald, and um, then he got ill and sadly yeah. passed away. And I wondered if you might share with viewers when this thing posts sure. uh, how you and Greg got together. What? Well, first of all, tell people a little bit about yourself because. How you you know which will lead to how you and Greg got together, but I know you've written several books in the music genre and this uh, or music category, and I'd I'd love for viewers to know more about you before we get into this specific book. Okay, well I'm um, I always start off with I'm a military brat because that's my identity. Growing up, my dad was in the Air Force, and so we moved around quite a bit, and uh, you know gave me just a great appreciation for our country. So I always start off with that. And then I obviously later on, I became a journalist. Um, I worked uh, at the newspaper for about 10 years covering city hall features, crime, everything you can think of. And uh, even before that, though, I started with books. And the first book that I did was on actor Steve McQueen. And mm-hmm. then I just kind of stuck with what I knew, which was uh, film, sports, and music. Those were the and, you know, us being around the same age, I think everybody grew up, every boy probably grew up with that. You know, those were the things that were important to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm listening to a great book now by Edward Zwick, who's a director, who uh, we had talked about how film was so important to 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 growing up in the 60s and the 70s. Um, you could be a casual fan, I guess, but those are those are the kinds of things that stick with you. And, you know, growing up in the genre, of the 60s and 70s, we were exposed to the greatest music, the greatest film, greatest writers, um, and some great sports figures. I mean, mm-hmm. sports now, I think, is really has evolved, but, you know, grew up with guys like, I wrote a book on them, Pete Maravich, uh, Joe Namath was another favorite, Muhammad Ali. You know, these were the start of big individualists. Uh, so, uh, you know, so my work has kind of surrounded pop culture, um, and those figures of the 20th century. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and let's see, you've done, can't remember all the books you did, but one that's standing out in my mind, as, aside from this one, is didn't you do a book on Bob Dylan? No, I did one on Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. All right. I knew it was one of those Close. guitar <laughs> slingers. Yeah. <laughs> exactly the same, but completely different. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Steve McQueen, uh, Johnny Cash, uh, Elvis, a couple books on Elvis. Um, did one on the uh, evangelist uh, Billy Graham, which was very, very interesting. Um, did one with Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters. Mm-hmm. And I've got a book coming out that hasn't been released yet, but it's my first true crime. And uh, it's it's on a serial killer from Tucson in the 60s. Wow. And, uh, producing a documentary as well to accompany that. And then there might be a podcast. So uh, cool. I'm just kind of, uh, uh, you know, still in the nonfiction realm, but uh, just spreading my wings a little bit. Sure, sure. So you mentioned Elvis. Did, were you a fan growing up or was that just kind of a peripheral thing for you? It was peripheral in the way that my dad was, uh, my dad graduated high school in 1955. Okay. Oh, he was the original Elvis fan. And, you know, Elvis broke out in 56. Mm -hmm. And my dad loved Elvis. So, of course, I heard Elvis all throughout my life, um, you know, how wonderful he was. But, you know, I was a Beatles guy because, uh, you know, I grew up. Well, I grew up in the 70s when disco was big. 
but I gravitated to the Beatles. And I remember in art classes, um, you could bring your own albums and I bring in revolver and, you know, then when, when they, when, when these kids, these disco kids heard the sitar, they looked at me really weird, like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> but I was always, um, one of those people, and I'm sure you can relate to this, uh, was always just, uh, uh not, not an old soul, but just gravitated towards older things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Steve McQueen is really not of my, uh, generation, but I loved them. Um, same with, uh, the Beatles, you know, um, everything from the sixties and seventies, I loved. Now I grew up with the seventies stuff, I, but in the seventies, I was always looking at the figures of the sixties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Cool. Well, on Elvis, I have to throw my, I know you probably have heard me say it on social media, but my first concert I ever attended was Elvis. It was in your backyard there at Veterans Memorial Coliseum on Easter Sunday, 1973. And um, I got there two hours early and um, was standing in front of the stage, checking out the black guitar that Elvis would always have at the first song or two of his concert. And I see this image of figure, you know, out of my peripheral vision. And I look and I said, are you Colonel Parker? And he wouldn't even turn to look at me, just, you know, like that. And um, I asked him, I, I saw my website, but I asked him where Elvis had been, you know, before that day and where he was going after. And then I said, uh, can I go backstage and meet him? And he goes, no, and turns around and walks off. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I just say, that's my first celebrity interview. And, um, and provided, you know, uh, let's see here. That would have been 51 years later, uh, the material for a segue to talk about this book. So, <laughs> so how did you, well, first of all, you and Greg, well, me, can I interrupt you? Let sure. me ask you a question. Sure. Since I, I have never seen Elvis live. I want to know what it was like for you. And, and I'm sure you've seen thousands of concerts since. How was he, what was his energy level like? And what was, how was he different than any other performer? that you've ever seen? Well, um, I'll correct one thing that you said. I've not been to thousands, even though people think I have, and they think I, because of who I get to talk to, that I party like a rock star. Too old for that crap, and I don't party like a rock star. But, um, but yeah, I've been to a lot of concerts. And, you know, keep in mind, this is 1973. We don't have the huge, huge productions that we see in concerts and kind of expect for big name acts these days. Now I go to mostly classic rockers and it's still pretty basic. You might see a D Jumbotron or something if you go see somebody like Clapton or, or Journey or somebody. But back then, man, it was a stage. It was the band, the orchestra, and a, you know, lights go down low. And once he stepped out on stage, it was nuts. And I remember I was in eighth grade and he comes out on stage. Everybody starts screaming. And I'm an embarrassed to admit this. I've never admitted this before. So I, you know, I'm going to take it out on you. But I heard all this screaming that I go, wait a minute. I'm screaming too, like a little girl. <laughs> Cut this crap out, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what, what, what caused that? And, you know, granted, I was barely a teenager at that time, but the energy just to see somebody that all inspiring. I mean, he kept a mystique that since then only, I would say, Michael Jackson and Prince ever was able to come close to pulling off in a wholesome way. Yeah. You know, um, and I guess it's questionable if Prince and Michael did were wholesome but elvis by comparison to today i mean you know patriotic charitable giving um i know when we were moving from huntsville alabama to phoenix we stopped at graceland on our way to arizona you know middle for is in march of whatever that would have been 69 i guess we pull up to the gates of graceland and there's uncle vester you know wow. and 
he mom had guts, but I guess that's where I got it from. Wasn't afraid to ask anybody anything to get interviews, right? But she goes up to the gate and asks Duster, hey, can we go to can, can go around the property? You know, he goes, well, no, but I'll give you a couple of calendars, pocket calendars. And it was the picture of Elvis with the gold lame suit and a diamond, allegedly diamond lapels. Knowing the colonel, I would say probably is a lot of just, you know, cut glass or something. Who knows? But I still got those calendar cards in my in my stuff. You know, I had the programs from the concert and all that. But getting back to the answer of your question, high energy with low production. Yeah. And yeah. I dare that there's I dare to say there's very, very few people that could pull that off without some help. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So anyway, sorry for the long answer. But oh, no, I, I, wanted, to I wanted to hear a first person perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that 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 explains his his magic in a mm-hmm. nutshell. So tell tell viewers about Greg McDonald, who he is, how you two got together, and it will spill into the book. Sure. So uh, Greg McDonald was Colonel Parker's uh, protege, and he met him when he was around eleven or twelve. Um, and he met he met Elvis and the Colonel on the same day. He met Elvis first. Um, Greg's father worked for Oral Roberts, and then when they were not setting up tents and the tent pole, um, his father uh, worked in air conditioning, and he had the accounts to all the very rich and famous people in Palm Springs. Right. So um, in the summer, uh, he employed Greg who had a little wagon and he'd pull the air filters uh, and go from house to house. His dad would pay him a buck, uh, an air filter. And so he went into the estate of Jack Warner, who, who was, you know, who ran Warner Brothers uh, studio mm-hmm. and uh, un, un, unknown to, uh, to Greg, Elvis and uh, a very, uh, and a beautiful starlet were uh, staying there and they were out on the deck and, and uh, uh, he didn't know that they were there. So he let himself into the house cool. Uh, decided they well, was going to change the air filter, and then he uh, the, and I think the air filter was underneath the staircase, so he had to maneuver his way in there, and then his feet were sticking out, and then a little dog came by, a little poodle was like nipping at his leg, and he was kind of kicking at it to get away, and then uh, he hears this this southern accent, this booming voice going, "What are you doing down there, son? Get out of there!" And so he scoots his way out, and he's looking up, and he sees Elvis Presley. And uh, so he's trying to explain himself and why he's there and what he's doing. And, and Elvis tells him, well, well, come on out here, son. Uh, let's you and I talk. And uh, he says, I was just out there lounging with this. And then he, Elvis realizes his faux pas, this, this beautiful starlet, is sunbathing in the nude. And he decides he's going to shut the curtains, which he does. And then um, he starts grilling Greg about who he is. But it's a very, Greg said he talked to him you know, as an adult asking him who he was, generally interested, generally curious. They start talking about Oral Roberts. They start talking about the church. Um, and it was a, you know, it was a three hour conversation. And it was only interrupted by a phone call from Colonel Parker, who's asking Elvis, what are you up to? Because uh, El- Elvis lived, I'm sorry, Colonel Parker lived permanently in Palm Springs. Right. And, uh, and they lived and and his house was like a block or two from uh, Jack Warner's. So, Elvis says, I'm talking to this funny little kid. He's changing out my air filter. He goes, well, I need my air filter changed out. He goes, send him over when you're finished. So Greg pulls his little wagon over. Uh, he changes out Colonel Parker's air filter. Colonel Parker peels off a $50 bill, gives it to him, and says, what's this I hear about you working for Oral Roberts? And so whereas Elvis was talking to, to, about El, um, Oral Roberts in a you know, uh, religious way, Colonel Parker wanted to know what the scam was. You know, like, hey, when you when you push those little old ladies up there, are they are they walking into the wheelchair? Are you giving them help? And um, and so uh, and and you know, Colonel Parker had this carny background, so it was very mm-hmm. similar. And and putting up the big top, and and so he has a very long conversation. So when he so so Marie Colonel Parker's wife walks in and starts listening to the conversation and says, "Well, you know, where are you going to school, son?" He goes, "Well, I'm not going to school right now." And she flips her she she flips her lid and says, "Well, that's just wrong. You need to be in school, son." And so from that point on, 
they uh, they made arrangements for Greg to live with them while he went to school. And uh, they watched over him from the age of like 15 to 18 when he uh, went to high school, made sure he graduated high school. And mm -hmm. so uh, and Greg's the, the, the funny part in this book, you, you, which you might have read, was the very first concert uh, Greg produced with Sonny and Cher. Um, their high school only had a budget of $750. And I think the dance was like in 67, maybe two or three years after I got you, babe. So uh, they, so Greg, uh, the, the, the very first concert he produced was their home, the homecoming dance uh, with Sonny and Cher. And from wow. that point on, Colonel Parker started showing him the ropes. And, you know, um, to the point where Greg was successful putting on concerts in Palm Springs. So he never actually worked for Elvis, but what he did was he hung around Colonel Parker all the time and he, right. he knew Elvis and he knew everybody in the inner circle. And, um, and so, and he drove Colonel Parker to and from Los Angeles during the movie years, uh, helped them out uh, during the concert years. And, um, so what you have is this accounting of Colonel Parker as a human being, not this, uh, villain that you see in the Boz Lerman film completely. Oh, completely different take on them. Yeah, and, and you and I had an offline conversation or exchange about that. In fact, when I first approached you about interviewing you and Greg both, you want you, you asked me, what's your take on the Elvis movie? And my response was, I sent you the link to my review of it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I thought it was a well, very well made movie and costume right. and Graceland replica. In fact, I was stunned to find out well after I saw the movie three or four times that that wasn't even in. I, I thought they were using Graceland. They did a very good job of replicating Graceland and it was in Australia. Yeah. So it blew my mind. But I did not like, and I, you know, I've read pro and con about the Colonel. But what I specifically didn't like, just for viewers to know, is that we, you know, I didn't like how Tom Hanks wooed Mary on this, and he promised that he would accurately portray her, or him, and it made him look like a buffoon, which, you know, I, I only met the colonel the one time, but he was anything but what I saw in that movie, you know, and, and so... To get into that, what was your and Greg's take about the movie and specifically about the Colonel? Well, this book was really inspired by the movie because Greg had an inkling that uh, how Colonel Parker was going to be portrayed. So he wanted to really rush this book. So this book really it, it took six to eight months to write. And then of course we perfected it and edited it, but uh, we, it was going to be the, an answer to the movie. And then uh, the, the publisher decided to hold it back a little bit because they said, Hey, we need the proper amount of time to publicize this book. We really enjoy this book. We like it a lot. We're going to, we're going to really promote it. So um, it was, it was originally going to be the answer. And, and, and then when, of course, when we saw the movie, um, you know, and I've talked to a lot of other Elvis experts and I, I said, well, it's probably 50-50. And some of the other Elvis experts said, no, it's it's 80% fiction, 20%, you know. Wow. Uh, yeah. So some of the fiction being that uh, Colonel Parker was never fired. Right. Colonel Parker was never fired from the stage. Um, Colonel Parker was never um, held, uh, you know, the FBI never had any goods on him because he was an illegal alien. In fact, Colonel Parker served in the army, which a lot of people don't know. So, you know, his, his alien status was known to the United States because he, he, you know, I, I have, I have his papers that show when, when he went, entered the army, he mentioned that he was a Dutch citizen. So there was none of this hiding of his citizenship to, to, to uh, anyone. Now Elvis may or may not have known, but I, I think he knew because at one time, uh, in the 60s, Colonel Parker's brother uh, visited him on a movie set, and, and his brother mentioned, you know, that he was from the Netherlands. So, um, you know, Elvis had to either put two and two together or didn't think much about it. And Colonel Parker did not even think of himself really as, as, as Dutch. He thought of himself as an American. And he was a very proud 
and patriotic American and so, loved living here. And uh, that's how he thought of himself. So uh, this 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 whole notion that uh, Colonel Parker hid who he was is, is hogwash. So with that said, I didn't write this down, but the question pops in my mind. With that being the case, then what's the explanation? Well, I, and I, this is touched on in the book. What was the, what's the explanation of Elvis never touring in Europe or going overseas anywhere? I mean, usually that, that weight of the alleged illegal citizenship, you know, supposedly being, you know, murdered somebody, whatever. Why then, if all that's bull, why wasn't Elvis ever touring Europe, Asia, wherever? What, do you have? Was there any? Did Greg have anything? Which, by oh, the way, yeah. I mentioned this earlier. Greg passed away. He got sick, and yeah. our interview couldn't happen because he had to undergo, you know, some medical treatment, and then he passed away. So, um, but yeah, you know, from what you know from your conversations, what. Why did the, a, 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 you know, a global tour never happen? Well, uh, I'll give you a couple of different perspectives. So I did a book with uh, Elvis's bodyguard, Sonny West, in 2007 called Elvis Still Taking Care of Business. He told me the same exact thing that Greg McDonald told me. And that was is that Elvis was very heavy into his uh, pres drug prescription use. And of course, he carried a lot of firearms on him. So there was always the worry that Colonel Parker couldn't protect him abroad. And so um, the the other thing that Greg told me was that Elvis had no interest in going overseas. He had been in Germany. He had had enough. He had, he had seen enough, and he just wanted to stay in the states. Um, but with that said, um, in the in, in the writing of this book, I also did I, I also did some research with uh, Charles Stone, who was the tour road tour manager for Elvis, and he said uh, that Colonel Parker was in the process of setting up uh, ten concert appearances at Wembley, the indoor stadium. Whoa! Yeah, and he had he had he had the contracts, and he was getting ready. He had the tickets, and he was ready to fly over. It was the first time in many years that they had that many dates available. And so they took it. And Greg even showed me as part of that truth that he, he showed me a uh, uh, an insurance uh, piece of paper that, that showed that Elvis was getting ready to fly over there. So yes, he, you know, he, he didn't have any really interest in going because if you recall at the time, because of taxes, the Stones would tour England uh, intermittently, and they didn't make much money. They always said the, the big money was in the States. They they toured England as an obligation. So in right. Colonel Parker's mind, the money had to be there first. Right. Uh, and if you look at Paul McCartney's tour history um, in the 70s, uh, and, and uh, you know, he didn't uh, he didn't tour England that much either. Um, right. It's just simply the, 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 the venues weren't very large uh, and then the taxes, of course, were uh, uh, the artist. Yeah. So, so those those are sort of the reasons that uh, I was given. Um, and again, by by two independent sources. Um, but the other thing, too, was that because, you know, quote unquote, uh, Parker was an illegal alien, he couldn't go over to England. Well, he didn't need to go over to England uh, or anywhere with all this. Charles Stone would have been the the, the tour manager and would have run things just as he did on the road in the United States. Mm -hmm. So Colonel Parker didn't have to be there all the time. Yeah. Uh, he, he he went there when he wanted to go, right. which is when you saw him. But uh, but he was basically, he went on the road in, in the United States to collect the money. That's what he was there for. <laughs> and he kind of the Peter Grant, what <laughs> Peter Grant was to the role, to Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Exactly. So what, how did you and Greg meet up and get together on this book? So um, I was introduced to Greg by a lady by the name of Ruth McCartney, who was Paul McCartney's stepsister. And I've known her. Oh, okay. Well, you know what a great lady she is. Yep. And we've had a friendship for a long time. And so Greg knew her and she said, hey, you guys need to talk. And so we did and we met. And I go to Palm Springs maybe three or four times a year because I love it. 
And um, so I said, hey, next time I'm, I'm there, let's let's meet. So when I was there, he 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 showed me everything that he had. Uh, he Greg had inherited Colonel Parker's estate. Um, because when you know, Colonel Parker didn't have any children, and then his last wife uh, had passed away, didn't you know she didn't have any children, so everything went to Greg. Uh, so when I met him, you know he he only showed me a sampling of his stuff, but a lot of it were contracts, canceled checks, and he showed me these these contracts, and every one of these contracts Elvis had signed, you know. Uh, so w when people say, well, you know, he kept Elvis in the dark, well, no, he didn't. You know, he 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 signed every little. A uh, contract that had to do with a concert appearance, um, and so if if you know, he he, I, I felt that Colonel Parker did a really good job of keeping Elvis informed of what they had. But the thing was, was that when they did business, it was just the two of them. Nobody else knew their business, and that's the way they wanted it, and that's the way they kept it. But well, one thing I picked up on this is just to your point, just how in tune to the business. Elvis really was. I mean, I kind of grew up thinking it was just just the music, which obviously it was the majority of who he was and the performance and, and everything tied to it. But Elvis was aware enough, it seemed to me like, that he had a clue about how, you know, how things were supposed to work, what ticket take was like, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I'm sure that was purely because of all the conversations between he and the colonel. You know, but uh, so that, you know, there was actually two protégés, Elvis and Greg, you know, so. <laughs> but um, so I, I so I just wrote down random things here and these notes go back to when go. Well, like let, let me interrupt. And you, you bring up a good point and a point I want to make. And that is when somebody becomes famous, this doesn't really get talked about a lot. But when somebody gets famous, they are exposed to a lot of things and they pick up a, a, an Another type of education, uh, and that is exposure, exposure to to what you had just talked about, exposure to a lot of things, exposure to the business. And if you want to stay on top, you have to know your business. Mm -hmm. You know, Elvis wanted to stay on top, just like I have to stay on top of of, of books and, and trends and what's going on and and what uh, what I can expect, uh, what what percentage I can expect to pay. Uh, how much do I have to pay a publicist? You know, I'm exposed to a lot of those things, and if I don't retain those things and stay on top of them, you know, then 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 that's on me. And the same applies to Elvis. He was exposed to a lot of these things, and um, he picked up on them. And he was a smart guy. So this this picture that's painted of Elvis is this uh, poor country hick. I just don't buy. No, well, you can't have the mind. I I, I think about a lot of things now. The older I get, and I mean, I think of how did he come up with the 2001 Space Odyssey intro? Who, I mean, I would love to know that story. How did, who come up with that idea? Because you can't hear that song now, whether it's from one of his albums or from the soundtrack of the movie and not think of Elvis, you know? Yeah. That, I believe it, Elvis I'm, came up with that himself. Really? Wow. And then he, and I guess he and Priscilla, um, kind of worked together on you know, on the original stage costumes when he was, made his comeback and, you know, going to Vegas, all that, the high collars and all that, which I won't go back to the movie. I'm kind of ADD on this and, you know, pardon okay. me jumping around like that, but did you see the Priscilla movie? I have not yet. I've, I've read a lot of reviews on it. I do want to watch it. I have read her book. I understand that the movie is very faithful to the book. And uh, even without watching, and I, I would tend to believe that the movie's very true, and it's her experience. Hmm. I see. I had a different take on it, and I uh, do, uh, and maybe it's well. First of all, I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the Elvis movie. You know, even with the uh, the flaws in the Elvis movie, there's no Elvis music in the movie. Right. In fact, it had Tommy James in there. So it's almost like radio background music, you know, and I love Tommy James. Don't get me wrong, but um, but I, I felt like there's a lot of selective memory, let's say, you know, and there, it, there, there was, has been with her in the past. Yeah. 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 And, and, and from what I understand, it's a very insular movie uh, com com uh, compared to this big sort of epic that's kind of bouncy and, 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 uh, and you know, has a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, the, it's such a uh, what's the word eye candy, and you know, 
uh, there's like 30 different things happening at once with the Boz Lerman film. Whereas yeah. Priscilla's movie, from what I understand, is completely different than that. Yeah, very much so. It, it's, yeah, I, I, I just think there's worlds of difference between the two films. One thing I picked up on the book and just random notes I have here is I didn't realize, you know, growing up, I'm a couple years older than you, but um, I grew up watching a lot of TV, Green Acres, and I was, I, I was just amused at the fact that the Mr. Haney character that Pat Buttram played yeah. is modeled after the Colonel. <laughs> what a hoot. <laughs> I watched that show too, you know, uh, growing and up. And they were the friends, weren't they? Yeah, they were, they were friends. Yeah. yeah. I, and I love that. I, I love, I love that little anecdote in the book, but uh, the funny thing was growing up in Washington, DC, we'd uh, in the seventies, you'd get all these uh, reruns. And so you get all the reruns of the fifties and the sixties. So mm -hmm. I'm very first and all that stuff and so yeah i knew green green acres like the back of my hand we could probably sing this the theme song together <laughs> <laughs> complete with accent yeah <laughs> the, the hick sound and all that but of yeah. course i have a running head start on you from where i live you know so <laughs> so another thing i jotted down there is the letter the Hank, there, and I can't, forgive me, I jotted these down before the end of last year. There was, I, I had a note here about the Hank Snow letter about um, the colonel cheering him on from the front. But what, do you, does that ring a bell with you or do I just need to strike this one from the record? No, I, I had to refresh my memory. Yeah, I, I, I don't recall why I had that written down, but I do know why I wrote this one. It's about the autograph lines between Hank Snow and Elvis. And I think you guys said that this was rock and roll's big bang. I love that line. Yeah. Um, and as John Lennon said later, you know, before Elvis, there was nothing. Explain to viewers what, what you guys really, I mean, I know what you meant by it from what I read, but explain that line a little bit more, if you don't mind. Well, you know, it's it's the converging of all these different forces together, and it, it really kind of happened in Memphis. So you had, you know, you had Elvis. Uh, of, well, the first the first Big Bang uh, would have to be uh, a rock around the clock, uh, mm -hmm. produced the idea of rock and roll, and then of course, then you had Elvis, and you had Jerry Lee Lewis, and you had Carl Perkins and uh, Johnny Cash, and it all isn't it interesting? It all happens right there in Memphis, Tennessee. You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So that's what we we considered rock and roll's big bang. Uh, you had all these musical forces together in one place. Um, that uh, that then when they all could kind of converge together and they split up, it you know you had this big and rock and roll then became mainstream. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people really appreciate how it was back then because so much of it was hot crowded buses and or just cars and you know small time record contracts like with sun records and you know selling things out of the trunk of your car so to speak and that kind of thing and i mean, i i think a lot of the younger generation really doesn't they don't have a clue what it was really you know what was entailed back then and why it was such a big deal that Elvis became as big as he became. You know, today people just, I mean, we look at Taylor Swift and she's a billionaire. And, you know, probably single-handedly highly elevated the NFL. You know, so, but, you know, back then with Elvis, I mean, it was, it was scary epic, you know, just mind-blowing. And part of that goes... And I'd like to hear your take on this some more is is on the I mean, just how much the colonel changed the celebrity business. I mean, his marketing prowess. I mean, the things he introduced, he came up with. And it's common stuff today. But back then, it was almost scandalous because of how it hit people with what he was doing. Talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Well, let, let's start off with the idea, though, that, you know, um, Elvis was a regional star when Colonel Parker uh, took over his contract. And, you know, he was signed by Sun Records, which was a regional record label. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, Elvis made 
some of his greatest music there, but it wasn't mainstream. So he was a regional star at the time. Right. Um, and, and Colonel Parker, uh, who had, had managed uh, Hank Snow and Eddie Arnold, um, had the uh, mechanics in place to, 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 and the machinery in place to, to put Elvis in that spot where he needed to be, meaning RCA Records, which is a national uh, music label. Uh, when he started hitting it big, he got him on Ed Sullivan. And by the way, I just read an article the other day, which I thought was pretty amusing. He got, Colonel Parker got Elvis $50,000 in 1956 for his first Ed Sullivan appearance. The Beatles got $10,000 per appearance in 1964. So they did, the, 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 I think the Beatles appeared three weeks in a row. And they got ten thousand dollars per parents, but you know you're, you're talking. Colonel Parker got him fifty thousand, which I looked up is the equivalent of about seven hundred and forty-two thousand um, dollars. So this was the kind of firepower that Colonel Parker brought. So, so it, so he he takes him from a regional star to a to an international star, and he puts the RCA uh, machinery in place, um, uh, and 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 of course, I mean. It was it was perfect. Heartbreak Hotel being the first single that Elvis cuts for uh, for RCA um, exposure on television, and then of course these Colonel Parker's ten steps down the next road, and that was movies. You know, he got him into the movies. Um, none of this was happening for any other rock star, and Colonel Parker made all this happen. Of course, there was merchandising. He elevated his pay for every concert appearance. Um, you know, he made Elvis Presley a very rich man. The, the, the problem was, is that Elvis said in the very beginning of the relationship, Colonel, you worry about the money coming in. I'll worry about it going out. He did that well. <laughs> and, and so Colonel Parker did bring it in and, and El, Elvis's father, Vernon managed his money, not, mm -hmm. not Parker. So, you know, when you talk about all these spending sprees and why Vernon went crazy, it was because Vernon handled his money. So, um, a lot of people like to blame Colonel Parker on that, but that was, you know, out of his reach. As a matter of fact, Greg Greg was telling stories about how, um, you know, Colonel Parker would send him $100,000, and two weeks later, they get a frantic call from Vernon saying, can you send $200,000, you know? So they were they were going through their money pretty fast. Yeah, which is often, often the case with people who go from poverty to wealth, without any training, education, guidance, whatever. And, you know, when you make it, you know, Elvis made his own deal on that one with the colonel, so he has no one to blame but himself. Yeah, and at a very young age, I worked for a corporation in the 80s when a lot of people were making really big money, and then um, and then it all went kind of downhill, and, and nobody saved their money. And, uh, you know, you saw, you saw all these people... Uh, it, the, the the mindset was though that I saw. I worked in the mailroom, so I wasn't making the kind of money they did. But the mindset was was I'm young and I'm rich, and this is always going to come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that's and I, I I apply that to Elvis. You know, he was, you know, he was very young when he made it big, and that he 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 was telling that to Sunny West. You know, oh, I can always go out of the road and make some more. Yeah. Well, you, you would have thought that that period of time between the movies and the comeback when I think it was in the Jerry Hopkins book where they talked about him walking out of the studio downtown somewhere I think it was LA or Nashville and people walked by and didn't even know who he was and that's what precipitated the one of the things that precipitated the comeback special you would think you would have learned from that to be smarter because it could happen again, you know, but so the, so there was a funny part in the book when, and you touched on it in the beginning of our chat about the Colonel wanting to know about the scam with Oral Roberts. The, and there was something where the Colonel said, or the Colonel or Elvis, I forget which one it was that you guys said, he said, I knew it. I knew it. And what was that? Do you recall what that was? I think it was the wheelchair, the wheelchair scam. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, he was. He was wanting to know if if they walked into the wheelchair or did they really literally have to be, you know, um, uh, or did they have to be pushed up or did they, could they do it on their own if they wanted to? 
Yeah. Rick said, well, we gave him a little help. Yeah. <laughs> it was like the Benny Hinn thing where they pushed people down, you know, that kind of right. thing. Like, you know, I'm not in the Pentecostal denomination anymore, but like Elvis, I grew up in the kissing cousin of his denomination. And uh, so I, you know, I'm sure he and I could have shared some funny stories or scary ones. No snakes, no snakes at all. But um, but yeah, I mean, for I'm sure there was a heightened curiosity, especially with somebody like Oral Roberts. You know, what's the deal? What did they do? You know, and and with the Colonel's uh, Barker background, you know, yep. that the, the Carnival background. I'm sure there was some some hand in hand type of stuff. I jotted down about the Colonel and Howard Hughes. What was the connection there? Well, they actually played cards together in Palm Springs. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. he, he had these, uh, we didn't go into it that much, but it was, it was kind of a footnote. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was uh, before he, uh, before, you know, Hughes really became a recluse. But I'm, I've always been fascinated with uh, Howard Hughes. So when I saw that, when I saw that and I heard that, I went, mm, that's got to go in the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had two reclusive people there tied to the colonel. You know, Elvis could be, and obviously Hughes was. What was the big takeaway for you? You know, you, I'm sure you had, I mean, you've interviewed Sonny. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. You worked with Sonny West on the, his book, and that was after the Elvis What Happened book, right? So, right. first of all, was there anything... Did, did Sonny say anything about the, you know, between Elvis What Happened and then his own book, his solo book, that he said, well, I wish I hadn't said this or I wish I would have said that differently or anything? Was there anything, and I know we're getting away from this book and I'm asking yeah. about that, but was there any any changes in Sonny's feelings? I hate to say story because it sounds like he was being disingenuous and I don't mean that. But was there any big change that he made or that he said, he, you know, anything he said between the two books? Yeah, you know, he, and he said in the book, he said, I wish, well, first of all, he, he talked about the first book. He said everything in there was true, but it was presented in a very sens sensationalistic way. Well, yeah, but, he had that one guy helping him with, I forget his name, but he was a Dunleavy. writer. Yeah. So that's what he said. But then he says in the book, I wish I would have done a better job of conveying my love towards Elvis. And I really do believe that Sonny loved Elvis. And I know that he would have taken a bullet for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because those guys, you know, uh, the Memphis Mafia often gets tagged as guys who uh, uh, were hangers on. Now, some of them were, but the guys that stayed long and were loyal were not. And they were... Uh, they, they, they had legitimate jobs, especially when Elvis was touring. You know, Sonny did advance work. And um, and then Red West, of course, was a, a bodyguard. And uh, so those guys were a lifeline, I think, to Elvis's sanity. And then in the end, when he got addicted to pills, he got rid of all the old friends. And so you can kind of see where, you know, when he got rid of Red and West, I'm oh, sorry, Red, uh, Sonny, and Dave Hebler, they, those were the last guys that that said basically, you know, Elvis, you get a problem. So what did Elvis do? He got rid of, he got rid of them. And so Elvis got rid got of the messengers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, he's, he basically said, I wish I would have done a better job of conveying my love for Elvis. So that's why he wanted this second chance with, with our book. But the other interesting thing that he told me is if this is the first time I ever heard it. He said, you know, Colonel Parker wasn't the bad, the bad, the heavy guy that everybody portrays him to be. He goes, he he taught me the the trade. He goes, you know, he goes, El Elvis, Elvis used Colonel Parker as the heavy. If Elvis wanted to get out of something, for example, Star is Born, you know, the movie, mm -hmm. um, Colonel Parker would just up his demands to the point where people would just back out. So yeah. they had this thing of never saying no. But here are our here are our demands, and you know, so it's kind of a classy way of uh, not bowing out, but just saying, "Well, if you want us, you're going to have to pay for it." Creating, creating the desire not to buy at that point. <laughs> correct, absolutely. <laughs> which, which, by the way, it's funny how things kind of intertwine. The huge outdoor concert scene of the Star Is Born was filmed right there in your backyard at ASU Sun Devil Stadium. So, and Elvis played there too. Well, he played the. Um, 
the indoor. Uh, what's the uh, no, he, but in '76, Elvis played the uh, Sun Devil Stadium, one of the few outdoor places he ever okay. played. I yeah. didn't know that. I thought it was at the uh, the indoor one. I he did. He he played he played Veterans Coliseum in '70 70 and '73, but I think in '76 he came to Tempe, Arizona, and uh, and played there. It was a, it was a strange date because he didn't like playing outdoor places. Right. Um, and it was one of the larger venues that he ever played. And if you see the movie, Let's Spend the Night Together with the Rolling Stones, uh, the opening shot, you'll see where they they uh, they played Tempe, Arizona as well. So that, and that that, sta that stadium is still there mm -hmm. and they they refurbished it. They um, they were they were considering knocking it down altogether. But what they did was each year they just uh, renovated a section. So uh, it's still there, though. Well, and you mentioned Dave Pratt. He has a funny story about being at that Stone show and introducing uh, George Thorogood when he wasn't supposed to. <laughs> so, isn't it funny how it all just kind of cross-pollinates? You know, it's almost kind of like, you know, I don't know, it's just it was supposed to be, you know, it was meant to be that way. Did I tell you my funny Dave Pratt story? No, uh -uh, share it. Okay, well, since he'll be watching this, so I get this strange text, um, like, hey, uh, uh, he meant it for someone else. And I get this text from him, like, hey, let's get together for lunch. And I text back and I said, hey, Dave, uh, this is Marshall Terrell. You don't know me. I said, but um, I listened to you for years. And I said, I actually read your book and I know the person, I know the person who put your book together. And then like, I sent it to him. And then like two minutes later, I get this phone call and he goes, you mean to tell me that out of all the people that I could text, I text somebody who's read my book. <laughs> and then what followed was like this wonderful hour long conversation about reminiscing about the past and about radio. And, uh, and then I, 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 and then I sent him a signed book after that and he sent me a, a nice card. So I, I think very, very well and highly of him. He's a great guy. Great guy. Funny and one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. Sometimes it'd be even more irreverent, but Hey, you know, that's, that's Dave Pratt. That's the mayor, you know. So was there a big change in your opinion of Elvis? I know, you know, obviously you had the Sunny book, so you already probably had been enlightened some during that experience. But was there anything else that changed your mind on anything about Elvis with by working with Greg? I don't think so. It just basically reinforced all the things that um, um, I thought and knew about him. And, and that was he was genuinely a very good human being. He was good to people. Uh, he was kind to people. You know, he uh, was very thoughtful human being. The tragedy, though, of course, was, you know, his addiction to drugs and um, and how uh, and then Greg even said, you know, uh, there were times when he was like, you know, I loved Elvis so much. He was so good to me and my family. And it's really tough to write these pages for you guys, but I got to be truthful, mm -hmm. which he was. So it was it, it was painful for him to to recount those years and to tell it like it was. But if you don't tell the truth, then what's the use of doing a book? That's right. I mean, I can truthfully say my opinion of Elvis changed some by reading this book. And in what way? I mean, I, in, in my adult life, I, you know, the things I read about him, I, I read with, you know, open eyes. I, I tried not to have any preconceptions about things. Obviously, Elvis, what happened was a big catalyst for that kind of view of Elvis. But I get, I, and I, I don't know that it's necessarily that the opinion went down as much as it became more clear and that was i think yeah. the big thing was how i knew elvis liked to spend money and those stories are the stuff of legend right what i didn't realize i just never pictured him as being somebody as all right we got to go tour some more because i i got to get more money i just figured he was almost childlike about it as you know how can i be broke i have more checks you know I thought it was more like that, but it, it, in reading your book, I realized that, you know, duh, he had to be aware. And if he was going to spend the money on stuff and on drugs like he was, 
even he would be aware that he needed to go out there and 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 hit the road. So that was I, I won't say that was you know it downgraded, but it was disappointing because I almost like that childlike innocence, you know, maybe. Yeah. But um, but my opinion, while I felt like it was neutral on the colonel before I read the book. I, you know, I, it was starting to elevate in his favor when I saw the movie because I did not feel like it was an accurate portrayal, if for no other reason. And I show it in my review, Marshall. I compared actual footage of the colonel talking to Tom Hanks's portrayal. And I'm thinking, where in the heck are they getting Tom's voice for the colonel here? And, you know, that kind of thing. And I, you know, some of the, you know, the the stuff about the, the comeback special and the, you know, here comes Santa Claus and all that. I, I Was that, was that part of it true? Was he really pushing the here comes Santa Claus thing, according Not to Greg? I'm aware of. I, yeah, I, I didn't think so. I, I would never heard that. And I read a lot of stuff about that comeback special. So, you know, already from the movie up until the book, I was already, you know, the colonel's opinion, uh, view, uh, the colonel's reputation, in my view, was already on an upward trajectory. But then reading your book and seeing what all he did and, you know, stuff about the colonel regularly putting flowers on Elvis's mother's grave while he was in Germany. Yeah, some of that's just good PR, but it also shows the heart of the colonel. And if he loved you, he loved you. And the same way Elvis was, you know. And, and so I feel like, I mean, it's unfortunate that the clarity had to come after the colonel was gone and after the movie was made, but I'm glad it was done. I'm, I feel like we have some, some a, a level playing field now for people to judge history, judge Elvis, judge the colonel um, a little more fairly is yeah. how I feel about it. So well, that's, that's a great compliment. Uh, and Greg... Greg would have loved hearing that, and that—that's all he ever wanted was to, um, to just get Colonel Parker's story out there. And by the yeah. way, I, we didn't get into this, but Greg was diagnosed with colon cancer t two weeks before the book came out, and so uh, that's when they said, "Marshall, you've got to do the PR for this." And so he, it, it and it, it, it hit him quickly. It, it, it took three months for him to pass, but you know, mm. it, uh, so anyway, but he, Greg was a. You would love to talk to him. He's just a warm, genuine human being, and uh, he loved Colonel Parker. Um, and he always said to me, he goes, Marshall, he goes, if you would have met Elvis and if you would have met Colonel Parker, of course you would be starstruck by meeting Elvis. He goes, but Colonel Parker was the guy that you would have wanted to hang out with because he was funny. He had great stories. Uh, he was just, uh, you know, down to earth human being. He uh, treated, uh, you know, there, there's anecdotes in the book where, you know, he uh, he was at a rundown hotel, if you recall, and, um, um, you know, bug infested. Um, and he went up to the clerk, and, you know, and he um, and he, he prefaced it with this is one of the nicest hotels I've ever been to. And because uh, he figured that the clerk had always probably was always hearing that the uh, it was a rundown flea bag hotel, but Colonel Parker said, "This is one of the nicest places I've ever stayed. Would you mind if I got two extra towels? And would you mind turning out that light out in the front?" So you know, the Colonel was a very clever guy, and um, and uh, he could get the best out of people, but he never picked on the little guy, which is what I liked. Uh, mm -hmm. But the but you know the other thing too was he um, just like with your encounter with him, I, I was laughing because he didn't mind being the heavy. He didn't mind being gruff, but you know, I've, I've been in situations where like I've put on some uh, photo exhibits and I had to be the guy in charge and I'd hear people whispering behind my back. Oh, you know, he should have done it this way. He should have done it that way. So I imagine Colonel Parker was in that position all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when, when you, when you're in that position and you hear, you hear people whisper behind your back, you get a little defensive and uh, you build up a shield and you, you basically say, no, this is my way and this is how I'm going to do it and I'm going to follow this. And so Sonny always used to say he, he made some mistakes, but he didn't make very many. And, yep. you know, at the time that he was doing it, he was blazing a path. Yeah. So nobody done before. 
<laughs> yeah. But one more thing I thought of, and I didn't write this down. Um, oh, no, not as big as Elvis, but getting there. And that's how I would put it this way, how the Colonel and Elvis pretty much, I say single-handedly, I don't know if you can say that about a pair of people, but brought Las Vegas back to life. Yeah. I mean, that alone, I mean, now look at Vegas, you go up there and you can see, you know, almost all the rock concerts go through. I mean, the Stones have played there, the Eagles, you know, on and on and on. I saw Guns N' Roses there the last time I was in Vegas. So, you know, they revitalized, you know, yeah. the winds and, and you know, the Hiltons and all that should be just making huge monu monuments to Elvis and the Colonel for making that happen and I, I i you guys detailed that so well thank that, you um yeah. to me that was that was an eye opener to me i guess if i had heard it before i didn't remember it and you guys really really detailed that in a great way well and the, and the beauty of of uh the vegas thing was twofold and the that was the elvis's comeback um, Elvis had, had mentioned to, to Colonel Parker, you know, I'd like to start start touring again. And he'd say, well, that's OK, but you got to you got to compete against them Beatle boys. And uh, <laughs> and if you don't sell out and they do, you're no longer the king of rock and roll. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that was pretty smart. That was hard, harsh advice to give. So Elvis didn't tour again until after the Beatles went off the road. You know, August of 69 is when that residency started. But the other thing was. Yeah, he started the residency, but it was also a way for uh, an artist like Elvis to make continual cash. So in the movie, you see him as this gilded bird in a cage. And he can never leave Las Vegas. Well, mm -hmm. he played Las Vegas twice a year, four to six weeks at a shot. So, and he toured the country in between. In but the, the point I want to make is that... Um, I think the uh, the 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 residencies were a great infusion of steady cash um, at the time. So uh, so I mean that was smart. He established there's always going to be continual income coming in mm -hmm. from those residencies, and then he can tour whatever he wants. And then of course there's the money from from the records. Uh, so you know Colonel Parker had him. You know, you know I think he earned. I think Elvis earned a hundred million dollars in his lifetime. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that there's a lot to be said for that. Now, unfortunately he, he only kept about a million of it. I mean, he spent yeah. it all taxes took all, you know, the, another big portion of it, but, uh, Colonel Parker, I think did quite well by him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two more questions or w one comment and one more question is the brilliance of the Colonel too, about all the Vegas thing was not letting Elvis be the first act. Yeah. But letting Barbara Streisand go, you know, again, Barbara Streisand, Streisand in the picture, this time with Vegas, not A Star is Born, but letting her go in there and discover all the bugs in the sound system and, you know, the quirks of the casino and all that kind of stuff. That was brilliant on the Colonel's part. He knew when to take, you know, go in second, you know. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I have just recently read Barbara Streisand's memoir, and she writes about that incident. And she, and so she still doesn't have a clue that, um, that that was for them to work out the bugs. And in, in the book, she said, and Colonel Parker and Elvis graciously allowed me to open it up. <laughs> and I started laughing when I read that. I was like, yeah, 50 years later, you still don't understand. <laughs> so what do you have going on? After you settle all the 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 interviews tied to this, but oh, I know the other question I'm going to ask you, and maybe you can't talk to this, and I don't. I I'm asking it not for crass reasons, but just curiosity. Um, with Greg gone, do you know what's going to become of the things that he inherited from the Colonel? I really don't. Um, I really don't. He. Um... He had them secured, um, so it'll it will be interesting to find out what happens to that stuff. But I was lucky enough to to get a look at it. Um, I mean, a, a lot of that stuff had Colonel Parker's red wagon lo logo letterhead on there. Uh, I couldn't believe the canceled checks and the detail. 
And then Colonel Parker kept everything and everything was filed neatly. And I mean, that was that was impressive in and of itself uh, was the fact that he was so organized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but I, I don't know. Um, it, it, it would be nice if uh, Graceland, I mean, this was one of Greg's pet peeves, if Graceland would open a wing to Colonel Parker or do something to pay tribute to him, which they have yet to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but, but that doesn't go with the narrative of the film and the narrative of the film was endorsed by Graceland. So yeah. um, we'll see if that ever happens. I mean, um, at, w at some point in time, people are going to have to acknowledge, you know, the great things that Colonel Parker did for Elvis Presley. I mean, here we are still talking about Elvis almost 50 years after his death. And a lot of those things were attributable to Carl Parker. That's right. But well, we don't, you know, we as a society, we don't even talk about managers. I mean, you mentioned Peter Grant. Um, and of course, uh, my mind goes to Brian Epstein. Uh, Elvis wouldn't have become Elvis without Colonel Parker. Same thing with Brian Epstein and the Beatles. They just, I read a book recently by uh, Mark Lewis. And, um, and, you know, in the book he details, I think for two or three years, Brian Epstein was paying their salary out of his pocket. And he wasn't taking a fee and he was keeping them going. And, you know, it would have been very easy for them to to quit and go get a job. But uh, he he was the one that uh, dipped in his own pocket and didn't take wow. a paycheck for many, many years. And if he didn't do that, then, you know, and of course, he broke the Beatles out of out of Liverpool. But and probably the same for Peter Grant. I don't know much about Led Zeppelin and Peter Grant, but I would imagine the same thing is, is true of him as well. Yeah. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention before we sign off is how unfortunate and how unfairly it seemed like the colonel was treated by the estate. I, you know, and I, and maybe you can talk to this, maybe you can't. You know, there he was sued, and there was a lot of um, mischaracterization of the relationship between Elvis and the colonel. It sounds like. And yet, and here's what confuses me, and maybe this is just, is just how things go in that business or in this business, and much like how attorneys can duke it out in court against each other and turn around and go have dinner somewhere and love each other to death, maybe this is how it was between Priscilla and the colonel. I mean, she sung his praises and, right. you know, elevated him and, you know, all that, but yet the estate tore him to shreds. You know, the attorneys did, the accountants, the the, the trustees, if you will. Um, that one guy in particular, I forget his name, but, you know, just sliming the colonel. In way, and I have to admit, I believed it when I read it back in the day, you know, but right. it just is unfortunate that, El, uh, that the colonel couldn't have been part of the solution of building Graceland, because I think if if he and Priscilla had worked together, who knows what all that would have turned into at that point, you know? So well, what happened was is that Lisa Marie um, was when, when once when Vernon passed, the estate went to Lisa Marie and then the uh, the state decided that uh, they should assign someone um, to to look after his assets and look, and Colonel Parker had turned over all of his records. So if he had, he was guilty of anything, um, he wouldn't have turned over those records or so, yeah, the the documents. And so um, this this person had decided that Colonel Parker was overreaching, and then um, and then of course that hit the paper, you know, quote unquote, fifty percent. But yeah. you know, in the book we talk about what that you know there were there were pots of money. Right. Uh, now Colonel Parker did get twenty five percent. The typical Manager fee is 15 to 20, but because Colonel Parker was exclusive to Elvis, he charged 25%. Elvis could have walked away from that if he wanted to, but Elvis didn't want to because he got exclusivity from Colonel Parker. And if you're an artist, and if you know artists, which I'm sure you do, the the the, the greatest thing in their mind is if somebody's working for me 24-7 on my behalf, working to promote me. And that's what Colonel Parker did. So there were four or five different pots of money, um, yeah. movie contract, uh, um, movie recording, 
merchandising, um, and then it came to touring. Now, under the touring, what they had was a joint venture partnership. Right. And so what happened was everything, and Colonel Parker had to employ a team of employees to pull off these tours. So right. he had like nine or 10 guys working underneath them. And and under this, and, and I was just having a, a, a conversation with a rock promoter the other night, and I took, gave him this scenario. And so under this under this 50% deal, everything, all the expenses were written off the top for Elvis. So that meant jet fuel, entourage for 112 people. Everything attributable to the tour that could be written off was written off the top for Elvis. And then whatever profit was left over, they split 50%. So the, the rock promoter was going, wait a minute, tell me that again. So I told him again, he goes, I'd rather take the 15% of the whole rather than the, the 50% of what's left over. I said, I think most everybody would. Yeah. So that was where the 50% came in, but that was, that was what was publicized in the news. And so the judge in the case forced Priscilla and the estate to sue Colonel Parker. She didn't want to sue Colonel Parker. So they, they, so then what, what happened was Colonel Parker then took the gloves off and then sued everybody. And so in the end, Colonel Parker got $2 million and he won, but a lot of people don't know that part of the story. Yeah. So if he, he won that settlement, he didn't win the case. He won, he, he got, he got, a, they all agreed to settle and so, he got $2 million yeah. settlement. So in the end, Colonel Parker won, but he was forced to step away. Do you feel the Priscilla movie was made in response to this whole thing with Lisa passing and try, because now Priscilla's touring, going around doing these Ask Priscilla tours, you know, and stopping people, people pay to go see her talk and, you know, they can ask her a question or two. Well, here's the ironic part is that she and the state have had a party to the ways. Right. So she's doing what she can to earn a fake check because she was earning, I think, uh, close to a million dollars a year um, through the estate. So she no longer has that. So that's that's why she's doing what she's doing. Yeah, yeah. Which is sad because I mean, uh, she she is the one who uh, she's the one who built up the Graceland. You know, that's she's right. very very responsible. Yeah, very uh, she, smart. Very yeah. smart. She and another businessman. So in, in even afterwards, even after the settlement, while Colonel Parker was still alive, um, he was still secretly not helping out the estate, but offering his help, you know, whatever yeah. I can do. Yeah. And he Sound meant like a cool man. And I think you and Greg did a an amazing job um elevating the view, people's view of him, I, you know, it remains to be seen how fans will take it. People will believe what they want to believe. I know I saw a documentary a few months ago of some of the inner circle of Elvis talking smack about the Colonel and what they said was kind of replicated in the movie, especially the part of where Elvis was sick and, you know, the colonel saying, get that boy out there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the context, you know, they colored it one way and and all that. But to, you know, so I know there's a lot of people didn't like the colonel because he was the bad guy, to your point. And I would want somebody like that managing me if, you know, if I was worthy of having a manager, you know, I'd, I want I would want that pit bull, you know. And Absolutely. I think that. I, I do think you guys characterized him in a, a wonderful way, showing the true love he had for Elvis and um, the real life of it all, you know, how it really was between those two. And so kudos to you and to Thank the you. late Greg McDonald. I wish, I wish I was talking to both of you on this call instead of just you. No offense, because yeah. I love talking with you. We've had a lot of offline conversations, you know, shooting notes back and forth. And I hope that continues. I hope yeah. this interview hadn't changed any of that. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, um, maybe, maybe um, uh, if you want to continue on, uh, I can, I could actually uh, introduce you to Charles Stone, who was the tour manager. Oh, I love that. Pretty much back up everything what I've said, you know, well, and it's, I, it's, to me, it's I'm, important to document all this stuff while these folks are still alive. Yes, because and that's happened, why I do what I do. Yeah. That very reason. Yeah. And as you know, 
history will change when someone one dies because it's like, oh, okay, well then now we can change this narrative to this. Yeah, yeah. It's all the time. I, I, I would love that intro. We could. I would love to talk to him because I think he could shed, you know, put a little more color and flavor on this whole thing. And um, but not to not to verify what you're saying. I know you're speaking true. So it'd just be hearing some of his take on from you know on the road, all that, and how the road has changed from the yeah. Elvis days until now, all that kind of stuff. So I'd love that intro if you don't mind. That'd be great. So absolutely. And Absolutely. next time I'm in Phoenix, you and I have got to get together for some lunch or dinner, and we'll see if we can get the mayor in with us on that. Oh, too. that would be so much fun. I would love to meet him. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, my friend, thank you for your time. Sure. Uh, please stay safe. We'll stay in touch as we always do, and I'll let you know when this thing posts. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, my friend. Take care. All right, bye-bye.